My final guest is a dear friend who is a former foreign secretary, a former, albeit briefly, leader of the Labour Party and a former chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee. Dame Margaret Beckett joins me live now on the day that she confirms she's stepping down from Parliament, which we shall come to in just a moment, Margaret. Uh, you and I are uh, a, a, of an age who remember very clearly the Cold War, the Berlin Wall, Gorbachev, Glasnost, Perestroika. Like me, were you of the belief that maybe those bad days were all over? And did, you, did Ukraine and Putin take you slightly by surprise? Yes, um, it did. Uh, even, uh, you know, I, obviously I took very seriously what our intelligence and the American intelligence people were saying. Uh, but you kind of thought, but un unless and until it actually happens, you know, that it's, it's obviously trying to frighten everybody, but I didn't really, well, I suppose I hoped um, that he wouldn't cross the border, especially because, as you say, that seems to me to be tearing up all the hopes that have been uh, held ever since the Gorbachev era. And heaven knows Putin's done enough things to make people doubt them and to, to think that maybe things weren't um, going in the right direction. But this is such a, a, a reversal. I feel very sorry for the young who are plunged back into exactly the kind of difficulties and nightmares that you and I knew years ago and that we hoped had gone. Yeah. And, and I tell you the other thing that worries me even more, particularly for the young, and, and that's a, a, a powerful distinction. Uh, Dame Pauline Neville-Jones was just on the, on the sofa and we were chatting about it. The oh. ease with which both Moscow and Washington, Putin and Biden, are talking about first-use nuclear weapons. Yes. Uh, I mean... In the intervening years, as a matter of fact, the last thing I did in the Foreign Office pretty much was to make a speech on behalf of the then government, uh, committing us to pursue a world free of nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and, you know, that had cross-party agreement. And we, we felt then that things were rather going in that direction. But my goodness, they're not now. Worried? Sorry? Are you worried? Yes, I am. Yes, um, because, I mean, what Putin has done is so extraordinary that, you, you know, you can't help wondering whether um, he is ill or whether there are problems uh, that we don't know about. And, and people who have got that much power um, and who have, have lost touch with, with reality, because it seems to me that for him to believe, as he clearly did, the, the Ukrainians were just waiting to be welcomed into Russia was, is so far from reality that you do have to worry about it. Help me with this as well, Margaret. We were talking about it at length early on. Um, Joe Biden saying in Warsaw, such are his crimes and offences that this war criminal, this butcher, has got to go and calling for regime change, that immediately the White House says, no, 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 that's not quite what he wanted. No, a world leader like um, uh, Joe Biden mustn't say that. Why not? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I rather like Joe Biden, uh, and he's clearly a man of, of, of strong emotions and strong compassion, and I have to admit and I expect they thought so too, that when I saw that he was in Poland and meeting people who'd come out of Ukraine and hearing their stories and so on, I was positive you'd get a strong reaction from him. Um, and, you know, when he uh, reacts like that, he says things that, that perhaps a more guarded person wouldn't say. I, I do accept, though, that the White House people are right in saying that he's not really talking about regime change. I'm sure he's hoping that People in Russia are thinking about regime change, but that's not the same thing. Given that, that you know this era so well, but also how uh, the uh, Soviet Union used to work and, and how modern oligarchical Russia works, had you been foreign secretary, would you have pushed as forcibly as, as Liz Truss has done on sanctions as being the key leverage to put this guy in his place? 
Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, well, any weapon that one can use is not actually a, um, a weapon in the hands of our armed forces to, to be using. Uh, yes, ab absolutely. And I, I keep thinking to myself, all, all these years, to be honest, Alistair, if you, if you, I was going to say, if you talked, if you listened to people from like the Baltic states who had been under Russia domination for so long, they would have told you this is what Russia was still like at the drop of a hat. And, and they did. Uh, and, and I think people got a bit impatient with them because they thought, oh, you know, they're living in the past. But they always said that given the opportunity, this is what Putin would do. Mm. And I'm afraid it looks as if they were right. Yeah. When President Zelensky said, and it was uh, a few days, maybe a couple of weeks ago now, an incredibly impassioned speech, and he said, if God forbid Ukraine falls, then next it will be Moldova, next it will be the Baltics, and all the way up to the Berlin Wall. Do you accept that core piece of analysis that this is Vladimir Putin trying to unpick everything that Gorbachev achieved with the fall of the Berlin Wall, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and that attempt to live in the modern world. He wants to unpick all of it. Well, as I understand it, he has actually said that. Uh, I mean, he said that, uh, you know, definitely that Ukraine has no right to exist, but he's also said, you know, that there are these other countries that ought to be under the influence of Russia, ought to be, um, I would say, under the control of Russia. And I'm quite sure that's what they think he has in mind. And, and I'm sorry to say, I, I, don't get me wrong, this may be hopefully diminishing in view of his present experience. But I'm, I'm sure that when he set out, what he expected was that we're to, to be welcomed with open arms in Ukraine, um, for the West to mutter about it, but not do anything effective. And then he was going to start trying to undermine those countries that are now, and, and you know, I'm sure they're, they are thanking heaven that they came into NATO. This is why they came into NATO, because they've never really believed in the, in the moderate, kindly Russia that the rest of us hoped for. Yeah. I want to ask you one specific question, as it were, more on the domestic front. And we just had a a brilliant report from our Scotland correspondent about the 52 youngsters who've come from Ukraine and uh, are now happily settling uh, in Scotland. Not only as a former Foreign Secretary, Margaret, but also a chair of the Intelligence Select Committee, can you at least understand why this Tory government is cautious about security, not simply throwing the door wide open, or do you think they've made a mistake? I can understand them being cautious about security. Uh, I think they're right to be cautious. However, I'm afraid it's looking, it's looking like not just caution, but gross incompetence, uh, a, a mixture of incompetence and, and a very, very hard line policy on refugees and immigration, um, which just doesn't square at all with the rhetoric about how we're a country that has always welcomed those fleeing from persecution. If Pretty Patel had her way, I don't think we'd welcome anybody. Although the, I will let that one sit on the table because she's not here to answer it. And, and, but I, I know her view is that she's in favour of immigration, but for economic arguments. And that, that's, a, that's an argument that we've had before. Cases, it doesn't work out like that, yes. In I, principle, I, I, well, I, I didn't for Gordon Brown either on British jobs for British workers. It's always been a, a fault line through, through British politics. Um, but the point that was made, and I only want to test you on a second version of the same question in a sense, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister pointed out, rather than, than the Home Secretary, uh, that we are dealing with uh, a government and a leader in Putin who is prepared to send people to smear poison on door handles in Salisbury and, and poison people uh, with, with polonium uh, at restaurants in London. Uh, anything is possible. And, and the idea of using the refugee effort as a cover for sending bad people in is not Alice in Wonderland. I will tell you something that I don't think I've ever said before in public, Alistair, or perhaps not even um, in, in the office, because no one wants to seem naive. But when we first heard, I was Foreign Secretary when they murdered Alexander Litvinenko, 
And when I first heard about it, my immediate thought was that it was probably uh, gangster elements in Russia rather than the government. And I was quite taken aback to realize that immediately my most senior advisors were like, this is the Russian government. And then, of course, because of the mechanism that had been used, it quickly became apparent that, of course, it was the Russian government. But, but my first, uh, as you said earlier, perhaps Gorbachev-related thought was that surely no government would do that. Oh, we've just lost the signal there from, uh, from Derby, uh, which is a great shame. Um, Margaret Beckett there explaining so that... that he was of anything. I'm going to... In Margaret, can you hear me all right? Yes. Right. We lost the signal very, very briefly. I remember exactly where you were in explaining that, that when Litvinenko happened, you were foreign secretary, you said you thought it was gangsters and your officials said to you, no, no, we do believe that it is the Russian government. And you were then about to give us your conclusion of those two contrasting views, your initial reaction and what your officials told you. Yes, and, and, and I... Um... I sort of kicked myself for naivety. Um, but I do think what it means is that the prime minister is, I don't say this very often about this prime minister, prime minister is right for once that we do have to be careful and we do recognize, have to recognize the kind of people that we're dealing with. On the other hand, when it comes to talking about children, um, one may take caution a little too far perhaps. I, I take that point. Uh, and you, you, generous there in, in, in giving the judgment uh, that you did to the Prime Minister. Uh, and I heard, heard very clearly what you said about nuclear weapons earlier as the Labour Party. Um, disarmament and getting rid of nuclear weapons is now absolutely, totally, clearly a no-go area for the Labour Party. Keir Starmer's embraced that and taken the right decision, in your view. Oh, it, I was the Foreign Secretary when we put forward a white paper that said that we should keep our deterrent, but that we should prepared, be prepared to foster a campaign for complete multilateral disarmament and play our part in it, but that we shouldn't, in the interim, you know, we shouldn't set off by giving up our own nuclear weapons. That was the conclusion we came to. We reduced the number as, as much as was thought sensible and safe, um, but we didn't abandon the deterrent at that point. Uh, and that was even at a time when we thought that things were going in the right direction. And I remain of the view that we should push things to go in the right direction. When I was a, a teenager, we've been talking about the teenagers, um, uh, uh, around that time I joined CND. And the reason I did was not because I thought that was better than multilateral disarmament, but it seemed so impossible that there could ever be any kind of multilateral disarmament. But since then, we have seen quite a lot of moves towards disarmament. And one of the things that I do hope is that we don't come out of this with people abandoning efforts to reduce the number and to get rid of nuclear weapons, especially because they're talking now about so-called tactical nuclear weapons. The, the mind boggles. Um, anything that we can do to reduce, we've been very, very lucky over these years never to have a nuclear exchange. This is showing again how close we're sailing to the wind. So people should go on pushing for disarmament. And they've got to do it with their eyes open and taking the right precautions as they do. Margaret, great to see you again. And thank you so much for uh, so much of your time. Um, and uh, everybody who knows you will know what I mean when I say my thanks to you and uh, uh, my, my repeated uh, sympathies with you on your recent loss. Uh, you and Leo were always an absolutely brilliant double act. You wouldn't have been able to do anything that you did do without him. And may his, uh, may his soul rest. Uh, and uh, my love and thoughts are genuinely with you. Um, thank you very much indeed for your time. Great to see you again. And you. Bless you. Wow. Uh, I knew she was going to be a cracker, but uh, goodness me, Margaret Beckett there on taking the eye off the ball and the naivety, uh, her word, Thank that, you. that we shared with one another uh, about Gorbachev and the Berlin Wall uh, and the need to cling to those... Uh, nuclear weapons purely defensively. Uh, truly remarkable stuff uh, from the great Margaret Beckett. So grateful for her time.